Okay, so I've called this Learning Analytics and AI Goes to School. And the idea here is that you've heard from CZ this morning about how you can make more of the current data that we're all very familiar with. You heard from Tiffany, I was tracking all this on, face, on, uh, on Twitter because I, I couldn't be here this morning. It looked like a very interesting presentation about how the schools start to take ownership of the data. Okay, um, and I'm gonna suggest to you that there's a, another dimension that we need to start understanding. Um, we're gonna talk about the magic words, AI, which everybody's getting very excited about. Um, but this is not all science fiction stuff I'm gonna be showing you. This is stuff that works now and will be in the near future. Okay, I don't know how your Dutch is, but uh, this is one of my favorite tweets. What's this saying? <laughs> Check the huge difference between knowing and measuring. Okay, and this gets at some of the concerns that people have around data and measurement, of course. Okay, we have this beautiful, organic, slightly mysterious, living thing on the left, at least before it was chopped off. And we're going to try and understand that by dissecting it and visualizing it. And look, we've got a lovely bar chart there. And now we understand how that beautiful thing operates. Well, we understand some things about it, but clearly we've lost something en route as well. And really, this is when we talk about data literacy, data curiosity, whether data is dumbing down and quantifying things in, in ridiculous ways. These are the kinds of things we're talking about. And we've heard just, you know, just now after lunch from, from uh, Amy's work and, and, and the other work that you know, schools are trying to get at things that we really care about, especially for a, fu a future-oriented kind of pedagogy, like their, their mindsets, their, their dispositions, and so forth. We'll come back to some of that. OK, here's a way of thinking about analytics and education. All right, here we have at the macro level, this is the stuff that we get from PISA and CZ at state, national, international level. Um, if we're lucky, we get league tabled and named and shamed as well. Okay. Then we have the MISO level, and I'll define MISO as the institutional level. Okay. And this is the data that you're all sitting on right now. Um, and we might name and shame NAPLAN HSC, um, for example. And we have, of course, all the other student you have in your student database. That's what student DB means there. OK. So what we're going to really focus on today is the micro level, which are the student activity traces that, that are generated during learning. That might be activity traces that are coming off ed tech tools that you have bought, where they are actually undergoing project-based inquiries, or they're learning their maths, or practicing their grammar, or their Chinese. OK, those are this, there's huge amounts of data there. And why are those platforms gathering all that data? Because the company wants to figure out what's going on. You may also get a dashboard coming back. So, but before we dive in there, let's just think about the MISO level, for example. OK? So, um, uh, We've had a little bit of work going on. We've got the principal of Mount St. Benedict here. And one of our data science students, Dorothea, did some work with them. So we have data science students here at UTS who are looking for three-month projects. And some of them are getting interested in education as a space to work in. And they have been learning statistics, visualization, machine learning, how to bring data sets together that are siloed. And you could have one of them in your school if you wanted to, to pitch a project. Okay? This is exactly what Mount St. Benedict did. And they said, does NAPLAN predict HSC? Okay. And so what we did was the following. We did, in fact, um, well, Dorothea did a whole bunch of things. One thing she did, though, was rank all the students in year seven from top to bottom. Okay? It's just the rank order. Okay? And then we, we fast forward and look at what happened when they did HSC maths. So we rank all of those. Okay. Now, the question is, if you're really good in your NAPLAN, uh, we would, might expect you to be coming out at the top in your HSC. Okay. And you know, the, the right-hand line is shorter because we've moved up the scale and there's a smaller number of students. Okay. And if you were kind of middling ranked, then maybe you're going to come middling. 
And if you're sort of lower ranked, then you know, uh, you're going to come in there. So the question was, does that happen? So we can do a, a correlation analysis of that. And we can graph that data. In fact, we graphed it for two cohorts, OK? 2010 and 2012. And the question is, do the lines generally follow that pattern or not? Okay. Now, looking at it, it looks a little bit messy, but the answer is the, the statistics tell you that, yes, it did, generally. Okay. Not for English at all, though. Really, it's much more complicated. It doesn't, it doesn't. It's a much more complicated picture. Um, we did all sorts of analysis. Curiously, NAPLAN algebra is highly correlated with NAPLAN English grammar. You think about that, makes sense, doesn't it? That's the sort of unexpected discovery you make when you start exploring the data. All right? OK. So there's a lot of interest in certain quarters in building predictive models. This, this is inherited from the world of business, where they want to predict. You know, are you going to buy this thing? Are you going to click on that ad? Are you about to change your mobile phone provider? OK, so they love predictive models. And that's kind of coming into education. Is that a good thing? So let me ask you, is that actionable intelligence? Would it help you to know that statistically, a student in front of you is going to do very well or poorly? Because we've got a predictive model that says that. Would you do anything differently as a result of knowing that? I'll just ask that as a rhetorical question, OK? But what if they're atypical? What if they're one of those people who didn't follow the pattern, OK? So on the left there, you can see a student who did really rather poorly in NAPLAN and then excelled up to the fourth percentile in their HSC. And um, on the right-hand side, you can see the opposite. Okay. So the obsession with predictive modeling that comes in the world of analytics has to be treated with great care. Because we would not, for example, want to be denying access to a student to do the HSC simply because of some threshold rank and because a predictive model said, statistically, you're going to do really poorly. Because arguably, Right, I mean, that student is now in the shadow of his or her predecessors. That student might have very high aspirations and be very highly motivated. Right? So statistically, we could say this is going to be really hard work for you because you know, most students like you don't do very well. But maybe you're one of those students on the left. Okay. So just a simple example of when you build your data analytics capability, in this case by importing a consultant analyst, from, from our, our master's program, you start to be able to explore the data and do things. Eventually, you'd want your own analyst team to do that, if you had one. Okay. If we take conventional meso-level analytics, the kinds of data you've got at the moment, the kinds of things that CZ is making available, what do they tell you about which students are struggling this week? What were they struggling with with their homework last night? What does it tell you about the student's readiness for the lesson you've planned? What does it tell you about their learning strategies? What does it tell you about their collaboration skills or resilience? And I'll give you one word. Okay, not a lot. Okay, that is not some. These are not questions you can ask of traditional school data. This is why we have to get down to what I'm calling the micro level, where we are looking at the analytics that are coming off. I've put ed tech used by students there, but of course. Asking students for self-report is another approach, a more traditional approach. Okay. I'm focusing in particular here on, uh, on the kinds of analytics that are coming off um, platforms. But we will talk about self-report. Now, just to pick up on that, that very nice infographic that Tiffany showed this morning, um, she was you know, emphasizing all the different ways you can get data. But it doesn't actually include explicitly all that online data that is sitting on the platforms that your students are using increasingly. Google Classroom, project-based platforms, tr you know, training tutorial tools for the specific subjects. But you can't buy a product now that doesn't come with a dashboard. All right? Everything's got a dashboard that's going to paint you some pretty pictures. The question is, 
What's that got to do with learning? That's the question, right? And uh, certainly the early products were guilty of simply counting what was easy to count and drawing some graphs for you. Uh, most educators looked at them and said, that's really not very useful. Okay. Things are maturing now, but you know, computers can count some things very easily and they can count some other things very, with great difficulty. The computer will count very easily how many page views has this had, where did people look on the video, uh, w at what point did people download the resources. Okay. How does a computer tell you about persistence and resilience? How does a computer tell you about student self-regulation? Those, those are the sort of fundamental questions for, for learning analytics. Educational meaningful constructs and qualities. Okay, so very quickly, what do we mean by learning analytics? Well, it's uh, the intersection of learning on the one side, and here are all the things that w you all do all the time, okay? Very familiar language there. And on the other side, we've got the wonderful world of analytics, okay? Data, statistics, classification, machine learning, you know, all the excitement about deep learning at the moment and the, the mysterious abilities computers have of recognizing patterns. Text processing, right? Text, writing, one of the primary windows onto the student's mind that we have. Computers can do stuff with that now. We'll, we'll see a bit of that later on. Visualization, predictive models, there we are, okay? Now, what happens when you bring these two together? It's not an easy conversation, actually, okay? Because on the left, we've got some really quite complicated things going on there. And on the right, we've got the things that machines can understand. And what we're interested in is how can one inform the other? How could the analytics inform the learning and the teaching, I should say? But equally, how does the learning and the teaching shape the design of the data we're going to gather? Okay, and we just heard from Christine there that if she was doing it again, she might have designed the data better because she would have you know, been thinking about the whole cycle from intervention all the way through to trying to assess impact. Okay, there's a key circle that's missing from this. This comes from my background in psychology and ergonomics, and that's the human factor. Okay? There is a big graveyard of cool ed tech out there that never made it because didn't really understand how it was going to fit into practice. Okay. And it's not just how it fits into practice, it's how did that thing even get conceived in the first place? Who were they talking to? Who did they imagine was going to use this interface? Right? Have you thought about the privacy and ethics, et cetera? Uh, you know, if you try and bring in a technology that really doesn't align with your school strategy and priorities and where the principal is going to put the resources, then we've got a mismatch there. So it's every level of the human infrastructure we have to think about. Okay, so there's our holy trinity. This is what I would think of as a human-centered design discipline. You can't have effective deployment of learning analytics without those three. I'm gonna to return to that infographic that Tiffany showed. Brilliant as it was, I thought, hmm, what about the learners? Okay, and we have heard something about this. What if we could close the feedback loops, right? We know how important feedback is for learning. Well, all the excitement about big data in every sector, whether it's crime or health or finance or med medicine, whatever, it's about closing feedback loops so that you can track a complex system closer to real time and see what's going on. And in learning, we know what feedback means, right? So the idea that we could finally close the feedback loop to the students very, very fast, beyond what's capable when you've got one very hardworking teacher, is very exciting for me, okay? A quote here from a chapter that Simon Knight, who you've already heard from and I wrote, is to say, okay, on the one hand, we've got lots of educational researchers and learning scientists getting terribly excited about learning analytics because they've got a whole bunch of power tools now to study learning, all right? But hang on, it's the educators and the learners who are for the first time able to see their own processes in a, you know, in a way that up till now only researchers could. Right? You needed a PhD or a postdoc and some pretty arcane equipment to study collaboration in a lab. It's becoming possible to do that now with commodity equipment and to feed that back to the people who count. Feed that back to the teachers and the students. Okay. That's what's so exciting for me. 
And I'll be showing you some examples of that. OK. Oh, and then there's AI. OK, so so far, there's no AI. It's just capturing data, analyzing it for patterns, and trying to visualize it in helpful ways. AI, you might think of as adds two more circles here. On the learning side, it's making most impact on automated feedback and adjusting the task for the learner's ability. And on the right-hand side, we've got the ability to sense way beyond what just comes through a keyboard now. Okay, and we'll see what that means. Okay, so on the left-hand side then, the system has more agency, right? That's why it's being regarded as intelligent. It's got more agency. It can adapt what the student sees based on their ability. It can give personalized feedback. Maybe you've got a chatbot or an avatar. That's another example where you've got a chatbot or avatar that's asking you questions, or maybe you're trying to teach the chatbot. You've got a, a chatbot who clearly has some profound misconceptions about photosynthesis, and it's your job to teach the chatbot. Okay? Um, or, on the other side now, machines can sense a lot more of the world. Okay? Speech, gesture, posture, physiology, once you've got that smart band on, facial expression, and then there's the wonderful world of mobile and Internet of Things. Okay. And I'll show you examples where the machine knows what you're doing in the real world and what equipment you're using in, in some quite exciting ways. Okay. So let's think first about something that AI does incredibly well. Mastering maths. If you practice stuff, and it's challenging and stretching you just the next level. It's never going to get bored or frustrated with you. And you can do it any time of the day or night. Coupled with good human coaching that outperforms humans alone. Okay? That is a pretty robust research finding now. Okay? Stat tutor. These were university students going through statistics tutorial. And then every now and then they'd have a face-to-face -face coaching conversation with in a, in a tutorial group. Okay, students using this learned a full semester's worth of material in half the time, and performed at least as well, if not better, than students learning in a traditional way. That's pretty impressive. Okay. Assistments. You go to assistments.org. It's tuned for the U.S. market. Uh, but there's some pretty impressive evidence coming off here. Okay? Assessments showed in a controlled kind of experiment run through many schools in the state of Maine that there was 75% more learning going on than you'd expect to see. Okay? And there's the, you know, these slides will be available afterwards. You can follow the links if you want to know the evidence base. Here's an example of the teacher's dashboard. What are we looking at here? The teacher sends out the homework. The students do the exercises online that night. The teacher wants to re revisit the homework the next morning. But where should the focus be? Okay. 81% shows that um, uh, that's, that's how, how much they got per problem. But you know, the problem was 81% you know, got that wrong. Okay. What were the most typical wrong answers that students gave? Okay. In this case, 76% gave option B, showing some kind of misconception going on there. Okay. So that's a dashboard the teacher can look at so that next morning she can focus on the areas which are causing most aggravation. And if you go to that link, you can actually look at two video clips where the teacher is using the tool on the right or not on the left. And the researchers argue that the, the, the focus and the use of time is way more efficient because the teacher is zeroing straight in where the most misconceptions are. OK. Let's just push that out a little bit more. You're my class now. You're working on your laptops on tools. And I'm wearing a pair of smart, smart goggles, smart glasses. Imagine if I could look around the classroom and see floating above your head a small icon that showed me how you were going. Okay? That's a design mock-up, which is now being implemented at the moment. And just this March in Sydney here, we heard a report from this, this team at Carnegie Mellon 
where they're using an adaptive platform like the one I've been showing you, but they're experimenting, co-designing this with teachers to say, what if you could look around and see what was going on? And what if you then you know, clicked on a child, so to speak, and drilled in to see exactly what they were doing? Okay. And that's actually what they're now prototyping. So they're working with Microsoft's HoloLens and other, other interesting technology which will just become you know, dollars, dollars worth in, 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 in price in years to come. So that you can literally, in a, in a, in a limited sense, see inside your students' heads. Okay. Okay. All right. So lots of excitement around adaptive tutors. But very expensive to develop. To develop okay. You have to model the curriculum. You have to model the skills. You have to build models of what the, the student seems to master or struggle with. You have to write all the rules about what's going to do if they fail this test. We're going to back them out and try a different one. You know. And it's limited only to things that can be easily modeled by a computer. And it's very helpful if there are unambiguously correct and wrong answers. Right? And you've got a huge demand for this. Okay? So that's why STEM dominates this field at the moment. Huge demand to build that literacy. Very expensive to develop, but we can model what it means to master geometry, algebra, similarly with grammar. Okay. But what about all the other things that we care about? Okay. Communication skills, practical skills, the values students have, the critical thinking. You've heard a bit about review already today. It's being used in Liverpool uh, High. Uh, and maybe some other schools. Oh, you were mentioning it, um, I think, perhaps, Amy, I'm not sure. Okay, the goal here is to get beyond the grade. Get beyond the obsession with the grade and unpack what does that actually mean. Okay, so here at UTS, we've got a tool called Review, which is now a product. It's out there in many universities, but increasingly into schools now here in the Sydney region. And it's um, helping teams to design the assessment criteria and map them to what you might think of as the general capabilities. So Daryl Thompson, who's the lead on this, is working closely with teachers trying to make sense of all the guidance coming out about general capabilities. Here's a little view of the interface, which shows um, here you can see on the, on, up on the right there, um, what percentage of this assignment is addressing composing texts and comprehending texts? And we've got general capabilities here about communicating, collaborating, reflecting, etc. Okay. And the interesting thing, one angle of this is that the students do a self-assessment. Okay. How do they think they've done on this task? And they can add a comment about that. And they can add a comment about the whole assignment. Then they get to see the teacher's assessment, which immediately shows you, am I calibrating myself well? Right? What Dave Bowd calls evaluative judgment, developing evaluative judgment, which is the ability to know how well I'm doing, which is a lifelong learning skill. Okay. So you can see the students done well on that top scale there, but down here they were being rather modest, and here they were being a little bit over-optimistic. Okay. And they also get to see the class average as well. Okay, so this is part of the shift to try and you know, shift the paradigm, this, the, the assessment paradigm, to asking what does this number actually mean, and especially getting at these sort of generic capabilities because all of these assess criteria are mapped to the general capabilities. And then at the bottom, it calculates your final grade based on where the sliders were on the, on the, on the sliders above. Okay. Um, we've heard a little bit about learning dispositions uh, from Amy, and um, just to unpack one tool that we've been using here at UTS, developed by Ruth Deacon Crick, um, 60 item survey tool that asks you essentially what your appetite is for risk and uncertainty and complexity. <coughs> okay. Is it, you know, sometimes good ideas just come into my head. I have a sense of myself getting better at learning. If I find something really hard to learn, I usually think it's because I'm not very clever. There's a direct closed mindset question. Okay. Now the difference here is that it immediately generates a visual analytic, which provides you with a language for starting to reflect on your learning. And then there's a whole set of resources and coaching methods around that. And this has been embedded bit by bit into what we're doing here at UTS, uh, but it actually started in schools. 
right? So young people can understand this kind of language. Interestingly, when you start doing this at scale, for example, we've got about 3,000 student profiles here at UTS now, you can start to do statistics on these profiles. So we could ask, in this corpus, do we have significantly differently shaped profiles? Okay. So, and we could ask questions like, was there a statistically significant shift on one or more dimensions for a particular cohort after an intervention? Okay. And we might say that, for example, if we look at the bottom left profile there, okay, if that was one student reporting themselves as rather low on these dimensions of agency and curiosity and collaboration and belonging, well, there might be many reasons why that student is reporting like that. Okay? So we don't want to overinterpret that without really understanding the student's story. If we've got 548 students reporting like that, individual differences start to iron out, and there might be something systemic going on with that particular cohort. And of course, we could slice and dice this, dice this by faculty, demographics, or any other variable of interest that you might be interested in. So this may be a sort of qualitative early warning system of some, something that teachers would want to take into account. It's another example, Robin Nodge's work, um, tracking student effort through teacher observation. So not very high tech here, but the teachers have co-designed a very quick rubric to assess once a semester how much effort have students been putting in. <coughs> and if you follow those links, you can see quite an interesting visualization where you can track a pupil and you, know, you can see they might be immediately putting more effort in, so they're going to the, to the right, right? Their grades might not be going up, they might be going down for a while, and then they might change direction. But a student, as soon as they start putting more effort in, immediately they can see the results, even if the grades are not necessarily following. But this is the basis for a conversation with the student and their parent now. So we're going way beyond purely academic performance, and we're talking about the student's you know, engagement with their learning. And the topic of analytics for 21st century competences is something I'm really interested in, and, and there are some resources about that where we dive further into that. Okay, now this question of going from clicks to constructs. I don't know if you've ever seen what you get out of a system log, but you know, it's gonna be a lot of, a lot of basically a huge spreadsheet, you know, with lots of different events and timestamps of what students have done on a learning platform. How do we get from that to higher order competencies? So I'm just gonna show you one example, um, just to spark some thoughts, okay? So there's a team down in Melbourne who are studying which students seem to do really well on MOOCs, these multi, uh, massive online open courses, okay? Um, what does it mean to be able to learn well in an online course with no tutor support and just hundreds or even thousands of other students available to you who are all obviously at various different points in their learning. Okay, so they scratch their heads and this is just part of their analysis. But what they say is, okay, we're interested in certain behaviors and one of them is what we're gonna call recursive focus, one of them is called risk taking, one's called peer evaluation and one's called self monitoring and evaluation. And that might be derived from the literature about what good effective learning online involves. Okay? And then they say, what do students do when they are strong on these things? Okay. And they might say, well, they, they might um, engage in resubmissions on the video quiz. They might have another go. They, we might want to look at the patterns of the reuse of the syllabus guides we provided. Do they actually go and look at those guides and study them? Okay. Or risk taking. What do we mean by risk taking? Well, what we mean is something quite specific. It means they're, they're taking a risk and responding in, in the discussion forum, um, etc. Okay. So you try and operationalize these qualities you're after. And then we have to say, uh, what, how do we know? How do we know whether they've submitted a video quiz or not? Okay, so that data is going to be there. And then finally, we say we're actually going to set a threshold, right? So for example, if you, look, if you look at the top one, it said they resubmitted at least one video quiz. 
they resubmitted it in less than 50% of the video quizzes. Uh, you know, you can see very, very specific criteria there. That's what you can get out of a system log. Okay? So that's how you've mapped from very low level data on the right all the way back up to qualities you care about on the left. Right, now you may or may not care about learning in MOOCs, but my point is if you have online data, you could start defining qualities that you care about and you'd say, well, what do students do who are strong in this that we don't see in the weaker students? And how could we pick up proxies for that kind of behavior? And uh, let's take a guess at setting some thresholds. And that's how you could start to operationalize quite complex qualities in terms of the data that you're sitting on. OK, okay moving swiftly on. So I'm just flashing a whole bunch of things in front of you here. Each of these is like you know, a two-hour lecture in their, on their own. But there's follow-up resources. And you know, I'll ask you at the end, you know, how might UTS help you take the next step? And it might be by being partners with us and learning how to do this for yourself. OK. Students are out there. They've got their mobile phones. They're doing practical work. They're face-to-face. -face. They're not just sitting in front of keyboards. OK. So here we have some students doing a field exercise. Uh, it's something to do with looking at trees. Okay, how well did they do? Well, when you instrument that space, we can detect their posture. Okay, this isn't UTS work. This is work from Japan. But now we know: did they get down on their hands and knees and grub around the roots when we when they should have been? Were they looking up in the branches at the right times? Okay, so this is now no longer invisible to a computer. Or to bring it home. Just, to, uh, you know, just across the way from here, we have students learning how to resuscitate patients. Okay? It's, a, it's a, a ward with mannequins in bed. Those mannequins are streaming data. The mannequin knows when it was injected, when a measurement was taken off it. The mannequin can be sent into cardiac arrest. But we can instrument that space now. The students are wearing wristbands. We can slap little stickers on equipment so we know when they pick up a piece of equipment and what orientation it was at. There's an omnidirectional mic at the foot of the bed there. Okay. Why would we want to do that? Because when we talk to the teachers and the students, they're not getting good enough feedback. Right? There's one tutor walking around trying to watch about six teams, all working in parallel. There's a limit to how much quality feedback you could give each team. But now we can generate a timeline visualization for that team. And this is a, a PhD student's work at the moment. We've got three nurses, RN1 to 3. We can, pick it, we can detect when they pick up a device. We can detect when they administer medication. There's a critical incident, loss of consciousness. And then we look at them jumping into action there, ventilation, compressions, etc. cetera. Okay? So again, the scenario is that immediately after doing the simulation, they can stand in front of the screen and they can do a debrief. And they can look at that. Now, the machine does not know yet whether that was good or bad. But it's a provocation to reflection. Okay? And if we put up several different teams' timelines and they're rather different, that's a provocation to a really interesting conversation. Okay? So here, the, the AI is analyzing the data, picking up the, sen picking up the <coughs> sensor data, analyzing it, visualizing it, um, but it's left up to the students and the teachers to make sense of it. Okay? So the agency on interpretation is still very much with the humans. Let's think about writing a little closer to home for you. Okay? We care about crafting arguments. We care about the students' capacity to reflect deeply. And we often use writing to figure out whether they can do that. So here at UTS for the last four years now, we've been developing a tool to give formative feedback on writing. Here's an example. We want our students to learn to write better research reports. Okay? This will certainly apply in high school um, as well. Okay? Now, we know from huge amounts of scholarship that when you write a good research summary, you do at least three things. You, you are establish the territory, which says, this is a terribly important problem facing humankind. All right? You say, but but there's a problem. We don't know this. There's a debate about that. There's controversy about the next. Step three, I've got something to say about that. That's what you do as a researcher. Okay. 
And we can now recognize when students are making those moves um, in their research abstract, right? And here's an example below. It's a, it's a canonically good abstract. It is now widely accepted that timely, actionable feedback is essential for effective learning. Hopefully, we'd all agree about that. But the point is, that's the opening statement that says, this is a terribly important topic. That's why I'm investigating it. OK. A little further down. dum de dum de dum Something is a critical challenge. OK. Is a critical challenge. That says we've got some kind of issue here. Something's difficult. OK. Something, da 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 are not necessarily effective. Oh, we've got a problem. OK. And then down at the bottom, the author is telling the reader what they're about to discover when they read on. Okay. It's a, a summary signposting kind of statement. Okay. So, that's an ex so we've, we, we, we can now spot these what we call rhetorical moves and give feedback to the student. So this is what the actual interface looks like. On the left, you paste in your draft, you ask for feedback, and you get the report. And you can do this over and over again if you want to. One of our goals is to promote more effective drafting and redrafting. But the students have to understand what we're looking for. You know? So when we say, where's your critical voice? When we say, you know, uh, I'm looking for more uh, of your interpretation, they have to know how to translate that into English. Okay. And that's what they struggle with. And they struggle with that certainly here at university. And I know from my own kids, they struggle with that in their own schoolwork too. Okay. So here's an example. This is work did, did with Simon uh, Knight as well. Here is a law student writing. And you can see that um, they are, the, the system has identified, for example, contrast, which a contrast move is disagreement, tension, options, or inconsistency, because they're talking about a lack of careful formulation, something dum de dum de dum, which fails to appreciate dum de dum de dum de dum. Okay? They are using language to signal to the reader that we've got a problem of some sort. And, when we, and we, we involve the teacher in designing this, okay? because this is not a product you can buy yet. <coughs> this is stuff we're building here within the university. So we ask the teacher to annotate the output from the tool early on and highlight the sentences where the, the machine got it right or wrong, which helps us to debug it. It's also very important that the students understand why they should care about using this new tool. Well, because it's directly tied to their assessment rubric. Okay? And I'll come back to that later. But your analytics have got to mesh with your pedagogy and your assessment. Otherwise, the student doesn't understand why they should be paying attention to this tool. It makes no sense. Okay? So there you can see the assessment rubric on the left, the associated sentence types that we can pick up in the tool in the middle, and some examples on the right. And the students are provided with this. And you can read all about what happened when we actually ran these trials. Here are some positive statements from students about the kinds of effects it has on them. Um, tool didn't get it right all the time, though. So, you know, it's imperfect. This is language. It's very complicated to analyze for a machine. Okay? This is way beyond spelling and grammar. Um, and we've got some more recent evidence that this actually is, is associated with students making better improvements in their text and rating the whole exercise as a more meaningful, valuable exercise to do with the technology than without. And we're now developing what we you might call a learning design plan or a lesson plan, which is explaining to educators how you could design an exercise which uses this tool effectively. Because we've tried and tested this out as a pattern. And we've shown that this works now in law, and it transfers to business students, for example. Okay. And again, all of these are links you can follow up later on to learn more about. The other kind of writing we're very interested in is when students are trying to make sense of real-world experiences like on a work placement. Okay? So you'll be sending your students out on internships, work placements, or they may be going out on an outward bound course, or you're trying to get some learning out of a geography trip, or whatever it might be. Okay? Uh, some of you may be using reflective writing. Here at UTS, we know that it's hard to teach and it's hard to learn. Um, more students are coming through who have done this at school, but many have never written like this in their lives. 
to completely new genre because it's the total opposite of what you normally do when you write an academic piece. When you write an academic piece, you normally show how much you've learned, sound confident, and you know, don't give away your weaknesses. Okay? When you are being a reflective practitioner, we want you to talk about how you're changing, what you're uncertain of, what proved challenging and difficult, how you may have even made a complete hash of a situation. That's what you're going to get credit for. Okay? So it's a completely different language now. If you look at the key down at the bottom left there, now we're looking at initial thoughts and feelings about a significant experience that you had, what you found challenging, are you applying it to yourself personally? Um, a green triangle is how this might change the way you deal with the situation in the future. Okay? And so we have a completely different parser for this genre of writing. And you can see on the right there are some examples of, of the kinds of things that this tool was picking up. Here is a student who's been working in a pharmacy for the first time and actually having to deal with a difficult situation. Okay. Again. You can read all about that in more detail. And again, an example of how we work with the teachers. Here we have two educators and one of the team in the middle here. And we are trying to debug the parser. All that is showing them is which words might the parser think are emotionally laden words. Okay? And when you're dealing in pharmacy, you don't want every time the word blood, drugs, or pharmacy to, to be mentioned to be flagged in red. Right? That's not the student reflecting on their own emotions and, uh, and responses. That's just the student talking about what they do. Okay? So we have to debug the parser and get the thresholds right. Yeah? Okay. All right. Now, we talked about adaptive learning, where you have modeled to death what it means to really master punctuation, grammar, algebra, geometry. Okay? But you can give personalized feedback to students without having to do all that very expensive work. And here's an example of what that looks like. Okay. All right, now, here's a feedback message from one of our subject coordinators to a student. Sadly, they're not doing very well. Okay. They've really not engaged in the subject. They're struggling. And uh, the, student, uh, the subject coordinator is suggesting they go and attend a mentoring session. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's a nice piece of feedback to get. Well, it might not be nice, but it's hopefully constructive. Okay. Right, the point is that's one of over 800 unique emails sent to a student, sent, sent to that cohort every week. You fancy writing those emails every week? Of course, it can't be done humanly, but we're using the same technology that sends you personalized marketing through the mailbox or in your email, right? When a platform thinks you're interested in something, when they know a bit about your history and background and demographics, they will try and target you with specific pieces of information that they think will appeal to you. Okay? So take the same principle, knowing a lot about what the student did in the lecture, whether, you know, what the outcomes were of their assignments, knowing whether they showed up to the lab and whether they engaged in things, knowing what their formal exam results were, we can take all that data and say, if I see a student who's not shown up to the practical for the last two weeks, has barely logged on, and uh, when they do submit, they're only scoring passes and credits, this is what I would say to that student. And the, you know, the academic has a special editor. Uh, we're using a platform funded uh, by the government to do this. Okay? It's a special editor where you define conditions. It says, if I see this happening, this is what I want to say to the student. If I see that happening, this is what I want to say to the student. The machine then does the grunt work of compiling those emails and sending out those personalized feedback messages. And there's now evidence coming out that this really has an impact on students' engagement and, you know, um, and, and, and their outcomes. Okay. So just to show you another example where you could take essentially any piece of data you're sitting on if you've got rules that say if, then, you could start generating feedback emails. OK, okay. we're getting close to the end now. But we need to talk about trust. We already had a session this morning on data and ethics. Um, a skeptical way of looking at what's going on is that we, universities and schools, are outsourcing our core business, right? selecting the right resources, 
giving people the right tasks, giving them good feedback, and grading. And we'll, we'll give that to an algorithm. OK? How can we trust this? Okay. Now, what's very, very interesting to see is that over the last, only the last 18 months or two years or so, we're seeing some really good resources coming out, which is just educating the public on why algorithms are not necessarily objective uh, and why data is such a big issue. And you know, one book there, Big Data in Education, is specifically now you know, talking about this for education. Why would you want to care about the black box? Well, here are a few things just to sort of worry you. Okay, dear head of maths, Annie's now doing her geometry using Wizzo Maths. She's seeing different questions to her friends. How do you know the system's giving students the right questions? Dear head of English, Freddie's now getting instant grades from Wizzo Writer on his written responses about King Lear. That's spooky. How do you know the system's giving the right feedback? Dear parent, the following five research publications in educational data science provide statistical analyses showing that we can trust this technology. <laughs> well, that's one kind of response. But we have to figure out how to give really good responses that make sense to different kinds of stakeholders. Okay. Dear principal, where's the data from these platforms being stored? Who's it being sold to? How long is it stored? And can I have a copy of my child's data, please? Okay. I bet that's not in the contract that you signed with most of your providers. Okay, so just to bring it home, okay, uh, these are the questions that may be coming in. And as universities and schools are dealing with commercial providers, we have to be thinking about the kinds of contracts we're signing. Right? Universities are suddenly finding they can't get at data on their Blackboard or Canvas system they thought they could get access to because it's no longer sitting on the premises. It's sitting in the cloud somewhere in America. Right? Uh, and it's not in the small print that they can get access to what they thought they could get access to. It'll be exactly the same for Google Class or uh, any of these nice Silicon Valley platforms that you're all using. Okay? And if you want a deep dive into that, there's a talk you can take a look at around that. Okay, so just to wrap up, we did have about 60 leaders like yourselves in Sydney in March. Um, Michael Sena was there speaking um, about his very, very interesting product that allows you to see what, tool, what apps students are using. And we had several other startups, and um, the resources are available online for that. I really want to recommend to you this book by Rose Luckin, Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, specifically written for educators to understand, firstly, what is AI in the world of education and what is it not. She makes very clear how we need to think about the role of human intelligence and why that's still very distinctive. <coughs> and we should not be just thinking that AI is about to automate ourselves out of, out of uh, any, any, any important roles in society. And to, you know, particularly important, how AI can be used to augment teaching practice, not just to automate it. Okay, Great book. I uh, recommend that. Great book, Learning Analytics Goes to School. If you want to think deeply about how you might bring in someone like Dorothea, who's a data scientist, or what role your own data science teams could be playing, now that you, these, these are for real, it's a great book. Uh, it's built on some of the work that Tony Bright's done on improvement science. Okay? But it says, if we want to use data to really assess the impact of interventions, here's how we can do it in a really rigorous way, practical way. And there's also a new book just about to come out, I think, Learning Analytics in the Classroom. Again, trying to translate some of the work I've been showing you into terms that make sense for the school setting. So these books are just coming out now. It's a very new field, but there are some very good thinkers working on this. OK, so I'll leave you with uh, four takeaway messages. We need to design analytics that close the feedback loop. OK, for education, this is so important. For me, this is the big shift. Okay? It's not just power tools for CZ and your data analysts to study what's going on in the system. These are tools for changing what happens in learning and teaching on in a sort of real-time basis. The agency of the students and the teachers is critical here. Okay? 
um, we want learners to actually build critical minds about the analytics coming back at them. And especially when we're talking about higher order competencies like critical thinking, depth of reflection, whether I feel I have a sense of agency as a learner. You know, machines have only got a small grasp of that. The, agencies, the agency has to be with the learners and with the teachers to help interpret what the machine's doing. Done well, these are productive, helpful visualizations that provoke really good conversations. Okay. Technology alone will fail. Okay, we know that, it's an empirical fact. This is only gonna work when it's embedded into well-designed, robust learning activities, aligned with assessment. You need to build your capacity to design analytics. I'm hearing too many stories from schools who have bought a product, generated an ocean of data, and I'm not really sure what to do now. Okay. Learn how to critique the analytics as well. And finally, you know, understand what these you know, data analytics and AI can and can't do. Okay. So AI is definitely changing what we thought is distinctively human. Machines can do some quite amazing things now, but they're also very limited in other ways. Human intelligence remains vital. That Rose Luckin book talks very clearly about the kinds of intelligence we need to foster in humans so that we don't get automated out of jobs. Right? So ironically, we can use the very technology that's going to automate lower end routine work, but we want to harness that technology to build our higher order capacities so we stay ahead of the machines. All right? And that human intelligence is for both staff and students, again. All right, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much. I don't know if we have time.